So this webinar hosted by the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, the Better Care Network and UNICEF is follow on to the technical note that was produced by these three entities through collaboration with many other partners that formed the task force, an interagency task force, and Florence can correct me if I'm wrong, but 40 or 50 colleagues contributed to the, to the development of these, this tool and more is to come. But we felt that because millions of children across the world are in alternative care situations and a lot of them are put in very precarious situations because of the control measures put in place for COVID-19, an important need was identified based on feedback from field colleagues, which led to the, to the development of this technical note. So during this call, we will be presenting the technical note. So Florence will, will begin by presenting the technical note. We'll then have interventions from colleagues who are working in different contexts where they're dealing with, day, on a day-to-day -day basis, dealing with issues related to to alternative care and separation of children. And then we'll have time with more colleagues. So only four of the panelists will actually speak and present. Uh, then we'll have time with more of the colleagues that are um, on the panel for answering questions as they come in. First, just to start by introducing the panelists. Florence, if you, would, if you don't mind starting to introduce yourself. I'm Florence Martin. I'm the director of the Better Care Network. It's fantastic to be here today with you. For those who don't know, the Better Care Network is an interagency global hub of knowledge around children without parental care. We act both as a convener and as a hub for resources, information, news, I hope if you don't already, you receive our newsletters and you go, go to our website um, to access information around children's care globally. Thank you, Annie. Thanks, Florence. Hi, this is Laurie or Lauren from Save the Children UK, and I'm a humanitarian child protection advisor, and I'll be speaking today on Syria specifically. Thanks, Lori. Hello, everyone. This is Heino Kilma, uh, Assistant Child Protection Officer, working with UNHCR Ethiopia, uh, based in Addis Ababa branch office. Today, I'm going to present on our experience in the urban context related to alternative care. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Enko. This is Bridget Kennedy Feaster. Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. I'm a Senior Child Protection Specialist based in UNICEF in the, the Child Protection Humanitarian Action Team. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Anirudh Kulkarni. I work in child protection in UNICEF. Hi, good morning, everyone, and good evening. So my name is Martin Odiambo. I work with Save the Children. I'm based in Northeast Syria, working with, in the Syria response. Thank you. Yes, I can hear you better. I'm Abdunul from the National Council for Children Services in Kenya, presenting today as one of the team members, panelists for Kenya. And myself, Hani Mansurian, I co-coordinate the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, and I'm physically based in Nairobi, Kenya, actually. The Alliance, similar to Better Care Network, is a, is a network of organizations that focus on protection of children, primarily in humanitarian and fragile contexts. Florence, I will hand over to you to share all right, thank you everyone. Um, so this technical note, as Annie has pointed out, was the, the, uh, the product of a lot of uh, different individuals and organizations. And it came about in recognition of the requests that were coming out by practitioners in the face of the situation in the response of COVID and the, particularly how it affects children and alter, in alternative care and at risk of separation. So the note was written very much with a focus on supporting child protection practitioners and governments in the immediate response for children uh, to address the child protection concern faced by children who are at risk of separation or in alternative care in the context of the pandemic. It was recognized that we needed to be able to uh, respond to the immediate concern, but also that uh, different countries, different contexts are at different stage facing different issues. So the note is just the first of a series of uh, guidance and also it's evolving according to the information that we're getting and the needs of that field practitioners are identifying. As Annie said, it builds on the Alliance's technical notes on the protection of children during the, the pandemic, and it was endorsed by a whole group of organizations that you can see here. 
So the, the note recognizes, first of all, starts by recognizing both the direct impact of COVID-19 in terms of well-being, health of individuals, children, caregivers, but also the impact of associated uh, containment measures and how this particularly affect children uh, that are at, at risk or that are invulnerable or at risk of separation and children that are in alternative care. In particular, the emergency response, the services and the system that support children's care and protection. And the note recognizes and identify ways in, in which this, uh, this takes place. It recognized that children are at risk of increased, increased risk of separation and that there will be also an increased need for alternative care, either due to the illness or death of caregiver, uh, separation due to the containment measures, but also the socioeconomic impact of the crisis on families' capacity to care. And we recognize that this is both immediate, but also there are going to be major long-term implications for families in terms of how they care and, and the, the ability to access support in caring for their children as a result of the, socio, the socioeconomic impact. The note addresses the, and identify the risk factors uh, for children already in alternative care, as well as those who are in families that are facing uh, challenges. And in particular, those in kinship and foster care, those in residential care, uh, young people that have transitioned recently out of care, and also those who are living in, in some form of independent supervised uh, living arrangements. It also touches upon uh, children who are outside of family care or in care challenging settings such as, such as street situation and also refugee and migrant children. But the note also recognized that it touches upon it and that more guidance and more, more information is needed as well on that. So the first thing that the note does and the recommendation uh, addresses is really how do we keep children safe in family care? So it's the prevention imperative here in the face of the challenges faced by children, families and communities in, in the context of this pandemic. It's absolutely critical to start by providing the knowledge and to disseminate key messages to families and caregivers and, their children, and the children as well around different aspects of self-care, mental health and psychosocial support, positive discipline, so managing uh, the very complex situation that we're all facing in lockdown and caring for, for our children and families in that context. Um, it's also important um, to prioritize the support and the, res the resources for um, particularly at-risk primary caregivers. And in this case, we're particularly highlighting uh, older adults, the grandparents, the older adults that are often the caregivers for children who are living in kinship care, for example, and also those parents who are, uh, have disabilities or chronic, chronic illnesses and the, way, the ways this pandemic is actually affecting in particular their ability to care and, and may affect them either by falling ill or not accessing the services that they need. There's a strong recommendation to eliminate the barriers to accessing benefits in this particular uh, response uh, phase. And that means the conditionality, but also act, you know, providing access to the uh, cash transfers and other social supports that's available to children who are not necessarily registered or families that are not registered, registered either because of migration or they're not in their habitual place of residence. So this is uh, the phase in which benefits where they are available and social support that is available needs to reach all children including, of course, children on the move and uh, children on the street situation and, and those that are in, in uh, refugee camps and other settings. We absolutely need to also identify the need to um, identify and support and follow up those that were at risk of separation before the pandemic. So recognizing that the pandemic is going to hit them particularly hard, whether this was as a result of poverty or violence in the, in the home or a, uh, a particularly other particular risk factors, and that there's a need to identify them and provide support, recognizing the limitation of the current lockdown and the containment measure. This may need to be making best use of phone and, and virtual contact, and there's a, a range of resources and guidance on how to do that. But also recognizing that in some cases, in some communities, that may not be possible. Those are not available. And they may need to be also procedures for following up in the community directly through visits, respecting all of the uh, public health requirements. And that's going to be very challenging. The other important aspect of prevention is, and we know this from previous pandemics and epidemics, is we need to combat the stigma and the rumors and particularly work with community leaders. And, and that includes faith leaders that have a very key role in addressing the, the stigma and the misunderstanding and, and that can arise, that can lead to separation, that can lead to also discrimination and lack of access to services. So that's particularly critical. So in addition to, these are just some of the recommendations, there are many more in the technical note, but in addition to addressing the importance of preventing separation and supporting 
families in these difficult contexts to care for their children and to access services, there's a recognition, there's a need to protect children that are already in alternative care. And one of the things that the technical note does is to recognize that there's a need for emergency plans that are covering this particular phase uh, for uh, alternative care services. It can't be business as usual because it's this, the pandemic and the containment measure, measures are disrupting all the usual services and, and um, opportunities um, uh, for accessing services. Um, so one of the first things that the technical note recommends is there needs to be a very clear policy statement uh, on the prevention of separation and family-based care services. We know that in the context of crisis, uh, including pandemics and epidemics, that, um, that one of the real risks is that, as I said, vulnerable families are going to be under even greater pressure and that may lead to separation and abandonment. But also, we also know that in many cases, that's the setting where children may be pushed into institutions, uh, there may be uh, um, uh, recruitment practices, uh, and there may be uh, um, further institutionalization or longer term institutionalization of children. So we need to prevent this by having clear statement around the prioritization of uh, family-based care, of, of family prevention of separation and family-based care alternatives. One of the key things that needs to happen, of course, is the classification of alternative care services as essential services. And that means equipping them and resourcing them as well as recognizing them as fundamental to the health and well-being of children and their families in this particular period of time. There is going to be, and there are some countries that are already working on uh, immediate interim care needs uh, for those children who are separated and accompanied. And it's particularly important for the children that are in situation where they may have been exposed or infected by the virus and there may be some needs for quarantine with, again, clarification around and putting in place the alternatives, both within family-based care, but also addressing how uh, quarantine centers uh, are being developed and, and operating. There's uh, uh, an immediate need to prioritize orderly family reintegration of children who can be cared for their families. We know from research that many of the children that are in residential care have families, and we know that in many cases, they're not in, in residential care because they cannot be with their families, but because of lack of support and access to services in these families. So it's important, to, and we also know that uh, the situation of children in residential care situation in, in the context of a public health emergency um, leads to greater possibilities of, of contagion and, and health and protection issues. So we want to prioritize the orderly family reintegration whenever children can be cared for their families. And of course, this needs to be uh, based on an appropriate assessment. The other aspect that's very much affecting the response in terms of children in alternative care is the key essential personnel and staff that are uh, needed, but that are also being affected by the crisis and by the falling ill themselves, but also by the containment uh, measure. It's essential that they are identified as essential personnel, but it's also important to develop contingency plan to recognize that some of them will fall ill, some of them will not be able to work, and there needs to be plans for replacing these workers as well as supporting them. Thank you, Annie. In terms of residential care in particular, there's a need to prohibit the irregular admission of children into residential care. And that means strong gatekeeping mechanism that needs to be adapted to the current situation where contact and visits are, may not be possible. Uh, there needs to be a moratorium on new residential care facilities being established. This is not the time to be establishing any new residential care facilities. And at the same time, we need to ensure that these facilities are not closed rapidly without effective care plans in place. It's absolutely critical that children are integrated safely into their families with the support that's needed. There's also a need to sec secure supply chains for essential goods and critical services for these re residential care facilities at times where they may not be um, able to ensure that they have access to basic services for the children. And that would lead to serious child protection issues and, and health, of course, as well. In terms of family-based care alternatives, it's particularly important to provide material support to families that are offering kinship care, that are often not accessing other types of services, but also recognize that foster care parents will be facing a range of challenges through the containment measures, and that may include as well the need for access to additional support, financial and material. We also need to recognize that there needs to be ramping up of foster care. And in the context of immediate response and the, the lockdown, um, it, it may not just identifying new families, but also at reaching to existing foster families and 
determining whether they're able to take on more children into their care at this particular time. Identifying high-risk placement and making sure that there is support and contingency plan is absolutely critical at this stage. And also, there's a need to particularly focus on the specific needs of children with disabilities to ensure they can remain in alternative family-based care as well as in their families and that they are not placed into residential care at this stage, as is often the case because of lack of services. Finally, thank you, Annie. We touch, uh, on, we touch on as well the specific situation of children in the street situation, but we recognize that there is a need for particular guidance uh, uh, and additional guidance for the situation of these children, including their care. But it's absolutely critical that drop-in centers, shelters, and other facilities designated and equipped, not just designated, as essential services. And that means that they have the resource to provide these children and young people with the support, including the material and financial. The other important thing there is to ensure that these children are not arrested and, and punished for, self for not self-isolating. Clearly, they're not in a position to do so, but instead provided with the access to shelter and adequate housing. Finally, we recognize that care leavers, those uh, young people who have just transitioned or recently transitioned from care at particular risk during this period, including they might be living alone, they may not be able to access services, they may have not already got secured accommodation or livelihood. There are aspects uh, regarding the isolation and mental health and the need for psychosocial support, but also recognizing that it's peer support and funding for care leavers association and groups that provide mutual aid and advocacy services absolutely critical at this stage. So next step for the technical note, this is just some of the recommendation. It's being translated in a whole range of languages that are going to be available from next week. There's a policy brief that members of the task group are working on that's specifically for governments. And as I mentioned, and Annie mentioned, more detailed uh, guidance and resource are also being developed. There's a resource center on the Better Can Network website for COVID and COVID-related material. Please check it if you haven't already and also submit your resources. And there's work going on to document emerging practices and, and data, what's happening, what are the trends on the ground. So your input, your engagement, uh, your sharing of information and learning is absolutely critical there and we really welcome that. Please do contact us. I'm given three uh, emails there as the coordinator of the task team, but we're very wel welcome and we welcome your, your, your input and learning. Thank you very much. Florence, it was really, really interesting. And I wanted to just pick up on one point. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned many, many very interesting points and I hope that intrigues everyone to go and read the, those who haven't read the uh, guidance notes, the technical notes to read it. But just pick up on the, on the issue of prevention that you mentioned, that really, I sometimes feel like there's already a lot of uh, issues that children are facing, especially those that are in vulnerable situations, such as those in alternative care situations. But there's also this massive part of the iceberg. It looks like we're just seeing the top of the tip of the iceberg and the, the rest of it is underneath. Some of it we don't see some of it have not come up yet. So I think the focus on prevention is such a hugely important part of this. So thanks for highlighting that. So hi everyone. I wanna start off by saying a, a very big thank you, first of all, to, to give us this opportunity to, to talk about alternative care, but also to give us the opportunity to spotlight Syria and some of the work we're doing there. So my name is Laurie. I'm a humanitarian child protection advisor with Save UK and I am co-presenting with Martin, who is the senior CP specialist with Save the Children in Northeast Syria, normally in Northeast Syria, but currently in Erbil. So we wanted to take this opportunity to introduce you a little bit to the Syrian context for those who aren't familiar, to look at how we're supporting children without appropriate care, and to share the key actions that we've taken in line with the technical guidance note. As a bit of background, Syria is currently in its ninth year of conflict. We have a backdrop of a context that has weak infrastructure, weak rule of law, fairly consistent issues with access and quality of services. Prior to COVID, there were already a really limited number of child protection actors in Northeast Syria and also a shortage in funding. So our reach has already been impacted by these things and now further confined by COVID. In Northeast Syria alone, there are several hundreds of thousands of displaced people. So from the figures here, you see that there's over 160,000 people living in last resort sites. So these are community spaces, uh, which don't have 
reliable or sufficient or adequate basic services. We've got about just under 120,000 people that are living in 10 formal or informal camps and about 41,000 people who are in collective centers. So these are converted schools, markets or transit centers. On top of this, the health system and the capacity of the health system in Northeast Syria is extremely limited. In 2019, there was research done that looked at the public health centers in Northeast Syria, and of the 279 that were looked at, only 26 were functional. On top of that, there's not one emergency health center, sorry, not one health center that has sufficient emergency personnel and supplies to respond to the needs that COVID might bring. So in terms of COVID, there are 42 confirmed COVID-19 cases across Syria. In Northeast Syria, there's one, and Martin, you can correct me if that's updated. We know that the testing, there is a huge gap in testing abilities. And so we know that the number is likely to be much higher. As soon as there were reported cases in Iraq, which just is across the border with Northeast Syria, the self-administration, which governs the northeast part of Syria and the government of Syria, began to implement measures to try restrict the spread. So this included border closures, restrictions of movement and curfew, which has impacted our programming. There's also been an increase in restrictions of uh, the number of people gathering. If I'm not mistaken, it was about 20 people and now it's five people can't gather more at once. And of course, like many of the other contexts I'm sure we'll hear from today and have seen, schools and child-friendly spaces are closed, leaving children to remain at home. But in some of these places, these last resort sites, these collective centers, these camps, we're asking children to stay in really overcrowded, confined spaces. That's not really realistic. And in terms of kind of operational challenges we face so far, so phone signals very weak across Northeast Syria, and internet is not consistently available, especially in our teens' homes. And there's a disrupted supply chain due to the border closure and various other reasons. And so we're lacking the necessary PPE we need to be able to follow up on cases. Switching to alternative care. So alternative care, there's only a few actors that really specialize in alternative care. In Syria, the overwhelming majority of separation is due directly to conflict. We see that caregivers may have been killed or detained as part of the conflict. Children themselves may be detained. We've spoken to children who, who say they don't know if their parents even know where they are and if they're alive. And there's been a potentially chaotic displacement. So this is either from camp to camp or if there's an offensive and people run and get scattered, then they lose, lose family members. Um, then the types of alternative care available, there is kinship care, foster care, and interim care centers. So in terms of kinship care, this is the most common form of care that we see in Syria, and it's often done informally as we'd expect. In terms of foster care, this is quite interesting because it's not necessarily a norm within the, the culture. And we often see that actually there's a preference for if it's not kinship care, then residential care, which is something we've been doing a lot of advocacy for, which uh, can feel slow sometimes, but is just building those relationships and kind of chipping away at that. In terms of foster care, we say the children have 20 identified foster families who are on standby to receive children if they need. They've all been trained and vetted and have references from the community. One of the key challenges that we face with kinship and foster care is that we have unaccompanied children of different nationalities or with perceived affiliations, which can make it really difficult to place them in family-based care. Uh, so for that reason, we also have interim care centres. So the interim care centers have been running for several years. They were initially started to provide immediate, urgent overnight care to unaccompanied children. They were used a lot for children who were temporarily separated. So that's due to some of the previous causes of separation I discussed. But the idea of the interim care centers is that you can, it's a safe place for children to go. It's the option for tonight until we can find a longer term, better family-based care arrangement. So we run two interim care centers in Northeast Syria, and currently we have about 49 children in there. 
with the numbers increasing fairly regularly and again not due to COVID-19 but due to the conflict. This is something I'll touch on a little bit more later on kind of how we're adapting our interim care centres. So in line with the UN guidelines on alternative care, we're advocating and working with the camp administration and various authorities to make sure that we are first and foremost promoting kinship care and foster care and really really just sticking to the fact that interim care needs to be that last resort option there we go so in terms of alternative care and COVID-19 considerations so the technical note and proved to be really valuable for us in seeing what we need to prioritize. So we started first and foremost with coordinating with health colleagues to train child protection staff on COVID-19, what they needed to know, potential myths they needed to bust and ways that they could relay that information. We then worked to create child-friendly materials. So we've got comic that uh, we've been using with children in the interim care centers, but also children in the communities and the camps. We've provided training to our alternative care staff, who are also our case management staff, uh, on how to do remote management. We've reviewed high and medium risk cases. We've trained on COVID-19 considerations, and we're continuing to look at other training needs and remote modalities that we can explore. We've done awareness raising in the community, and we've adapted our programming where we, before we did um, positive parenting sessions with caregivers in a mother and baby area, we now meet with just five caregivers at a time and have adapted COVID-19 messages. In terms of the interim care centre, um, we've had to adapt how we run this based on COVID. So we've identified additional standby staff in case we need them to come and work in the centre. We have reduced the number of shifts so that we decrease the exposure of different people to children. We are procuring PPE to make sure that staff are prepared. And any new child that enters the space has a, receives a health check. All children in the space have their temperature checked daily. And we've increased cleaning facilities and we do one deep sterilization once a week, but we increase the number of cleaners and, and our materials to clean with. We've also done some activities in the interim care centers where we have children discuss and explore what they understand about COVID and, and work with them to, again, combat any rumors that we're hearing, make sure that accurate information is shared. And I should say, very, very hot off the press just moments before this call, we managed to get COVID-19 guidance for interim care centres online. And I'm hoping my colleague Becky will post the link in the chat box. But again, this is really our last resort option and not something we're necessarily saying should be done unless it's absolutely essential to have a, a centre. And if we don't have family-based care, that this can potentially be used. So what's next? So as a member of the CPAOR and one of the lead case management actors, we're continuing to contextualize and implement the interagency technical guidance. Our priority and our goal is to strengthen the kinship care, the foster carers, to identify children who are likely to be at risk of separation and, and to put in preventative measures. And then, as I mentioned before, we're looking at how we continue to strengthen our interim care centers, that we can receive children who require urgent care, uh, who, children who are healthy, who might require it for protection needs, children who may need to be quarantined and children who may need to be isolated. One of the opportunities that COVID has provided us with is we work with several residential care facilities. And this COVID has allowed us an opportunity to really advocate for increased hygiene standards uh, in these centers and, and, and hopefully giving us an opportunity to gain greater access in the future. Ultimately, we're continuing the positive parenting sessions. We're exploring new ways that we can reach the community and, and build the capacity of our caseworkers. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Laurie. This is really, really interesting, practical examples of how you guys have managed to adapt programming on the ground. And also, it was nice to see that you presented some opportunities that this is, this is uh, presenting. So 
I'm, I'm sure it's very much appreciated among the, the audience, uh, and I'm sure there will be questions on it. Okay, colleagues, on the context of Kenya, in Kenya, the first case of COVID-19 was confirmed by the Ministry of Health on the 12th of March, and immediately the National Council for Children's Services and the UNICEF activated a care reform core group, including relevant government and civil society actors, to initiate the necessary responses. The National Council for Children's Services, NCCS, chairs these meetings and this team, and uh, they start to establish and agree upon priorities and key messages and data collection. On 17th, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection gave a directive on the containment on coronavirus uh, and instructed institutions that were keeping children to return children to their families where possible. And action has already started and children had to be returned to their families from the institutions. And on uh, that first, the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection gave directive on containment of coronavirus, uh, part two, and especially on data collection. And that required all county coordinators, both for children's services and social services, to report on number of children returned home and number of children remaining in institutions. Messaging the care reform core team had several teams, and there was a sub working group involving involved in key, in key messaging, development of messages, dissemination of messages. This group included members from the National Council for Children's Services, Department of Children's Services, mm -hmm. uh, the Ministry of Health, UNICEF, Changing the Way We Care team, and other actors to inform the content of key messages for people working with children. The message targeted children, and they were age appropriate message in terms of language and content. The message also targeted parents, caregivers, communities, those working in refugee settings and with street connected children and the families and for residential care facilities. Final endorsement of this message was done by the principal secretary, the State Department for Social Protection and dissemination was done to all those actual stakeholders and all those ones who are involved, including the civil society organizations that had also, also been part of the development of these messages. Uh, on data collection, it's a working group involving in the design, uh, agreed upon data collection tool. The Department for Children's Services, DCS, and the National Council for Children's Services, after approval to all the 47 counties, and all the counties responded. And at least this data level one, uh, which has been received for the purpose of response, the information collected has been shared with the larger core team, initial data of children living care. And the total number of charitable children institutions in all the 47 counties of the country are 910 according to reports. The total number of children released from the institutions are as indicated. And of those, 4,012 children were released to the biological parents. The rest had gone to other care options. Details of these care options will be generated by a level two data collection tool, which has already been designed by the team and is ready actually for dissemination and has already been approved from all the quotas, including the team plus the ministry. Total number of children with disability released from these institutions, 1,330 children. And the total number of children remaining in the institutions is as indicated. However, this may have changed between the time when the data was available and now, and it's expected this was a process and more children may have been released. But that will be determined by the final level two data collection, information and results. Children and household level data two collection where possible to facilitate virtual monitoring, linkage to available services, including cash transfer, a long-term goal of sustained safe family-based care for those rapidly existed from the residential care is in the process. And this is the level that the two we are talking about. We expect it to be a child-specific 
data which will give specificities regarding a child in terms of the child's own personal profiles as well as the addresses and the, to link the child to the necessary facilities and to link the child to the necessary services which are necessary. Working with CCI is also going on to ensure quality of children parental in care. Linkage also has been done for the purpose of linking these children to services with both two entire government in our country of the national and the county governments and the field of such special from the Department of Children's Services and Children Department, linking with both county government and national government officials at those levels, and the services are being linked to the children, whether they have been released to families or whether they are in the institutions, and the best is being done to make sure that no child is left out. UNICEF and Changing the Way We Care program are also supporting comprehensive interventions in specific counties where they have projects. They are doing monitoring as well as linking of services, preventing separation for children. Government funds at the national and county level to support vulnerable households with the children is going on. Several hotlines also have been established. The child helpline, which has already been there and was serving children, has now become more handy. The SGBV and 719 has 719 of the Ministry of Health for COVID-19 information. Focus on inclusivity to ensure children with disabilities are able to access services, and the special attention actually is focused towards there. Uh, reviewing of CPIMS, the Child Protection Information Management System, domiciled at the Ministry and the Department of Children's Services, and the modules are uh, being actually being reviewed to ensure that we are able to address also COVID-19 data needs and the synchrony where possible as required. What happens next once containment measures uh, is prevention and alternative care needs are being prioritized and continued coordinated work with GOK, UNICEF and NGOs. Thank you very much. I'm sure there will be questions for you, but I'm glad the internet held up and we managed to hear a very interesting presentation from you. It's, it's actually... Thank you. I'm ready to receive the questions and they will be also my colleagues who are on standby also, I think, Fred and Dick. Fantastic. If, if, they, if they can possibly, possibly access. Thank you, Abdinur. I also wanted to, again, encourage everyone to continue writing your questions in the Q&A option. And for panelists who already, if you see a specific question targeted to you, to already answer, uh, if you would like. We also are receiving questions from Facebook, so we'll scan those as well and, and try to ask some of those. Without further ado, I'll um, hand over to Henko, who, uh, who will talk about some of the work that they do with refugee populations in uh, Ethiopia. Henko, can you share your uh, presentation? Okay, uh, thank you, Hani. Uh, let me share my presentation. Thank you, Hani, and uh, thank you, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank everyone for giving us this opportunity to uh, highlight what we are doing in the refugee context. And also, I would like to thank our child protection partner and everyone involved in the response. So I will be presenting the refugee context in the urban context in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. I will be brief when I present a context one. In Addis, in Ethiopia, Ethiopia hosts around 750 refugees. Out of this, 61%, the 61 percent are children. And there are 24,000 refugees in Addis Ababa in the urban context, and also have 482 unaccompanied and 398 separated children. In, in related to COVID, the current situation is not a complete lockdown. It's kind of the same lockdown. And the existing child protection center that is run by our child protection partner, just with the refugee service, that is closed. And also schools are closed and both government staff and UN staff and partner staff are required to work from home, but they still have access to the case workers, still have access to refugees and children, and face-to-face -face conduct already continued for high-risk cases. Uh, so far, no COVID case reported among refugees in our context as well. And we are expecting a potential increase of separation of children from caregivers uh, due to uh, COVID as well as due to other challenges and economic challenge. Uh, not in, un, even under normal circumstances, uh, finding family-based care in the urban context has always been uh, a challenge uh, for us. 
and with the additional uh, challenge of uh, COVID, uh, with the loss of, loss of income, and also many, since many of the refugee uh, population are uh, dependent on remittance and uh, due to the reduction of remittance from abroad, uh, we are expecting the s potential separation among the refugee population and children might definitely need alternative care. So in terms of ongoing and plan adaptation uh, related to alternative care, the, the, those things that I'm going to present are really both uh, ongoing and plan uh, activities. Uh, they are already reflected in the business continuity plan of our child protection partner. Uh, some of them are already being implemented and some of them are planned and we are working out uh, uh, on the possible implementation. So uh, the first, the main issue is uh, related to uh, the scaling up efforts to identify potential foster parents uh, by increasing engagement with the refugee uh, community. We are also working with the refugee outreach volunteers, uh, our child protection partner working closely with 21, 22 uh, refugee outreach uh, volunteers. Uh, these volunteers are specifically to the child protection pro profile and they are uh, trained on different uh, child protection issues and they are providing basic child protection service for uh, the refugee community, identifying cases and monitor alternative uh, care arrangements. Uh, we are trying to scale up our efforts on potential uh, foster parents and uh, we are reaching out uh, more refugee leaders, uh, especially at this particular time uh, working with the refugee community leaders and identifying potential pastor fam family become very highly relevant. The contact usually is through a phone, phone calls, trying to highlight the importance of family-based care at this particular uh, uh, time and highlighting the risk of uh, separation uh, and working together with the refugee uh, community. And uh, uh, we are also uh, trying to uh, work on uh, strengthening our uh, communication channel. Uh, the, working with the community-based protection uh, unit, uh, we are also uh, trying to establish WhatsApp and Telegram uh, communication uh, channels so that we can spread a message on the importance of family-based uh, prevention-related message on WhatsApp and Telegram. Uh, in in, in Addis, uh, uh, Telegram is found to be more popular, so we are also uh, working with the Bureau, our national bureau, to strengthen the system so that we can reach more family so that we can also streamline and share information on alternative family-based care, the, the importance and the importance of keeping family at this stage. And the other one is the monitoring aspect of the already existing care arrangement. This is uh, in the under normal circumstances. This was mainly done by face-to-face -face, uh, contact through home visits uh, by refugee outreach uh, volunteers and also uh, case uh, workers uh, from the partner agency. But at this particular moment, uh, 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 due to the downscaling of the service, uh, this uh, service is being uh, conducted through phone calls. And the refugee outreach volunteers uh, who are trained mainly focusing on monitoring of uh, care arrangement, uh, providing counseling for different existing alternative cares, uh, and also identifying uh, emerging issues within the family so that they can uh, be addressed uh, immediately and uh, help us to prevent uh, separation. So far, uh, what we uh, identified is mainly challenges related to assistance uh, during the phone calls, uh, assistance related sanit sanitation materials, assistance related to uh, some food items, and uh, the child protection partner also trying to link up them with other service providers who are in the position to provide those services. And we are also trying to adjust our programming so that we can provide those kinds of additional service. And in the identification of a potential foster family, what one thing I would also like to highlight, uh, so far uh, the issue, the effort has not been a smooth road. I would say it is a bit challenging, especially in the urban context, let alone in this COVID kind, kind of situation. In the normal circumstance, there is, always has been a challenge when it comes to the urban uh, context, but uh, it is not also impossible. We are uh, trying to identify and we managed to identify some potential foster parents. So uh, we are planning with the partners to provide the necessary uh, capacity support for those identified foster parents. And also we are uh, scaling up our efforts. The other adjustment uh, uh, in relation to COVID, what uh, we made is also super, uh, supervision for ROVs. The case worker, the national uh, case workers also uh, maintaining regular phone call follow up with the ROVs, one case worker supervise approximately five refugee outreach volunteers uh, and uh, discuss uh, the different challenges they are facing in terms of uh, care arrangement uh, and 
uh, when high risk cases, especially in the alternative cases identified, the case workers also take it up and also we are undertaking the regular uh, home visit to address those challenges. Uh, the other area, especially on the alternative care arrangement, especially to keep families and to prevent uh, separation is related to uh, cash-based intervention. Uh, currently in the existing uh, program, uh, around 80 uh, vulnerable uh, children targeted for uh, cash assistance and the child protection uh, partner continue uh, monitor and support those area. The adjustment we made uh, related to uh, COVID is one is related to the transfer modality. Uh, previously, the transfer modality was uh, through face-to-face contact. The, the, we didn't have the bank transfer. Now uh, we, tra- we uh, transit to the bank uh, transfer, but uh, we still have challenges in that area. Some of uh, the refugees, uh, they really don't have the, dec- the documentation required uh, to open bank account. And we are uh, trying to work together with uh, the partner and also with the government uh, to see, to find a possible solution to address that. And uh, so far for those refugees uh, who were not uh, able to open bank account, uh, the physical contact still uh, continue and uh, in, in, in provision of uh, cash assistance. And uh, one area also of cash transfer is also provided uh, two months as financial assistance rather than uh, giving it uh, every month so that uh, the family can prepare in uh, purchasing some required items in, in case of the complete lockdown. And uh, there is also ongoing identification of vulnerable uh, foster families. So this is also related to the or refer to uh, prevent separation. Those are uh, families, uh, those uh, children were not identified in the previous socioeconomic assessment, uh, but uh, now we felt that uh, uh, due to COVID, uh, there is also uh, a change of circumstance and the family might be uh, vulnerable, uh, they, uh, their status might be changed. So uh, there is a need uh, to uh, review those kinds of cases and to see uh, their, the, their current status and whenever possible. Uh, avail the necessary support to this kinds of families. So we are uh, reviewing our caseload and we are trying to uh, undertake uh, additional assessment and whenever possible, we will try to provide the necessary support. The other area is related to uh, individual uh, protection assistance. Uh, we call it uh, IPA. Uh, yeah, in relation yeah, to COVID, just, we are... Uh, sorry, Hinko, just, just mentioning that we're really running over time. It would be great if you could go okay. through these points quickly. Okay, just two points, that's all. The, the, second, the last one is individual protection assistance. Uh, uh, this is a uh, case by case. We are dealing uh, case by case, including for uh, separation. We, ha- we are trying to adjust our pool of uh, emergency funding, uh, including for uh, separation and to address those uh, kinds of challenge. And uh, finally, we are trying to adjust our programming and uh, shifting some budget line that is planned, uh, for example, for workshop and other activities that is uh, already planned, but not uh, going to be implemented as a result of COVID to address uh, other child protection uh, issues, including addressing separation and supporting uh, alternative care. Uh, so uh, these are some of the adjustments that we made uh, and uh, we are going to, uh, as the situation evolves, uh, we are going to uh, adapt to the situation. So uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Henko. It's, all, it's great to, to have such a variety of, of contexts being presented from Kenya, more like a development context to Syria, which is a humanitarian context, to Ethiopia, uh, the issue of refugees and IDPs. Great, so start posting, posing some of the questions to the panelists. Uh, again, we apologize if we can't get to all of the questions, but uh, I invite panelists to quickly unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll give you the floor when, uh, yes. Bridget, did you want to come in before sure. we go? Sure, I just will. I think, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks a lot, Hani. Just a couple of things that I've seen in the chat that I, that I was hoping just maybe I could quickly address from the humanitarian perspective. So one of the things that we're definitely seeing is that the economic consequences of the containment measures across the board are really contributing to people being on the move, whether people are leaving um, camps or they're also crossing borders returning, and that includes unaccompanied children moving. This is a, this is a concern, and, and I noticed a, a question regarding FTR. So, f- so family tracing and unification remains and should remain a priority activity. We, we do understand that there would be, there are some difficulties with that. When when p- children are moving back into countries, some of the issues that they that that 
that are faced is that they're sometimes required to be quarantined or isolated. So what do you do in those situations? And I think some of the questions are really right, right on to say, you know, we really do need to safeguard. So whatever the setup of any kind of interim or transit center, it should have, uh, you know, safeguarding measures, child protection safeguarding measures, protections against sexual exploitation and abuse, and, and really um, recognizing that there will be a variety of unaccompanied children in those settings. And then the question is, you know, when children are coming in, how do you do that identification if really it's a health response that's happening? So this may mean working with health, the health sector directly to try to train some health health workers to do some of that identification as children move into the, that setting. Um, and then, of course, there are there are issues related to transportation. If you do find a family, for example, you can spend that that quarantine time, that couple of weeks, doing the work of of finding the family, so that that those children don't have to wait. But then if there are travel restrictions within a country, what do we do about that? And I think this goes to some of the, the points that are in the technical note around what are essential services or how to how to mitigate some of those restrictions or mitigate some of the challenges. And that can be figuring out how to, how to get workers who can transport children back home. And as well, recognizing, uh, I think someone in the chat mentioned, you know, this isn't just about alternative care. Alternative care is part of a bigger child protection system. So the workers that we link to for child protection case management or linking to un those other services that are really necessary, the multi-sectoral approach, that's also key. And so in the preparation and planning phase, which a lot of different countries are at different stages of this pandemic, so they're at different stages of planning and execution of their plans, um, you know, how can you build into it those uh, those connections from the start and also recognizing that that because of the economic consequences, because of the restrictions, food security issues may be um, may predominate. Um, some caregivers, as was mentioned, are older, and so how do you deal with with that? And then in terms of foster care and alternative care families that are recruited, just to note that because of the the health consequences on caregivers, really need to look at the risks that those families that might be taking children might have. So if there are, are, are members of the family that have themselves some risks, they may not be, even though they may traditionally be a, a good or, or a experienced foster, foster parent or, or foster family, they may not actually be uh, the right fit in this context because they may have their own risk. So there, so it is, uh, it is a, a, a uh, kind of a compli complicated thing, but those are just some things that we're seeing as children move in um, and how you adapt your programming for that. It, it, you know, I'm really happy to see um, the Save the Children resource on, on interim care centers and safeguarding, really helpful. And I think, um, you know, I'm definitely going to take a look at that myself, but those are just my few thoughts that, on those issues. Back over to you, Hani. Thank you very much, Bridget. Very, very helpful to highlight some of the uh, specificities of humanitarian context and also Thanks for answering some of the questions in the process. The first question I'll pose is, is actually about uh, children living and working on the streets. Florence mentioned that we have tried to cover this in, that intel, in the technical note, but it's probably not in, in nearly as much depth as we would have liked to. How do we support, so the question is, how do we support children living and working on the street in COVID-19 context? Are there any specific country experience case studies on how to respond to COVID-19 situation for these children. What happens to drop in access for street connected children when there's a total lockdown in a particular city? Anyone wants to come in? I'll give priority to Annie and Martin who haven't spoken, but uh, anyone else is also welcome to come in. Street connected children, street families and uh, in our Kenyan context. In our context, first we have uh, a trust fund, a street family trust fund that is fully engaged into this activity. And uh, we are also linked link with them and they are part of the, our core team. And uh, from the reports they give us, uh, an experience they have had was immediately after the announcement by the Minister of Health and the first case was that uh, most of those street connected uh, persons and families have on their own left the streets. Then what remained was the institutions which were directly coming under them, registered with them, and they were doing monitoring and even in terms of data, we were getting data concerning that. And in terms of support, the trust had been supporting and also linking with other agencies to give them the support. On access to 
emergency funds for one of the questions that was asked. In the cash transfer programs of our country, which were going on, there was already linkage to those cash transfer programs. And also, uh, national government offices through the Ministry of Revolution is a linkage also uh, for children and their families to access support and something like that. On data collection tool, people have been asking data collection tool for households. It's a very detailed tool. And the purpose of this tool is to ensure that we get the children who are released uh, and uh, to where they were released up to the physical address uh, and all other ways in which contacts can be get, got so that link services can be linked to them. And on the virtual actually monitoring we have talked about, we were talking of uh, officers in the field, especially those from the ministry, but also other, other ministries and linked ministries and experts who are trained, like the social development services, they have lay counselors uh, who also help also in the cash transfer programs. It is all about issue of coordination and uh, uh, this is how we were going about, but still I would wish to ask uh, uh, other members from my team who are in the, in the panel now uh, to add up on it. Uh, and I'll ask Mr. Frederick Mutinda to add up to the matter I said. Thank you. This is Frederick Mutinda. I work with Catholic Relief Services. I think Mr. Abdinuri, you have covered it well. Uh, maybe that one of the challenges that we are seeing, especially for the children who are connected to the streets, is that um, some of them, because now they are voluntarily agreeing to come out of the institution, some of the practical measures has been for them to have a temporary um, isolation just for checking and ensuring that uh, they are being screened. And that is posing a challenge, but as a country, we are trying to see how best can we address this. Because so it's a new scenario that we are finding ourselves in, but for sure, as we continue, we are learning more techniques on the same. Ovan, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, anyone maybe very quickly to close on this question? Any burning? Just to say, Hani, that uh, this is Florence, just to say that um, it's been recognized that there, there's a need for a lot more learning and guidance around street connected children and, the, you know, the particular challenge uh, they face. I know this consortium on street children has already provided some important messaging, um, but we will, the task team is going to be looking specifically at developing uh, guidance, hopefully on this and building on the learning that's been shared just now. Great. So next question. Is, is related to refugee context. So um, if, if any refugee parent is positive, how do we ensure the alternative care of children where very limited residential or family-based care is available due to fear? Uh, well, I'd like to come in on that. Basically, for, for now, we have measures that have been put in place in order to address this. However, we've not been able to record a situation where we have a refugee a family that has been tested positive. However, what has been put in place is that one aspect is we have, uh, if the child has, has been confirmed not to be uh, positive, that child will basically be placed in another foster family. However, I think it was already mentioned that there are some challenges with uh, foster care in a refugee setup, especially in India. And this is basically due to the kafala system. Those of us who know about it can attest that uh, in such context, kafala system is more preferred than uh, foster care. However, uh, in the event that most of these children, in the event that this child is actually a refugee from another country that, that but does not have any relative within the camp and no foster parent is able to take care of this child, we have the the ICC, which is the trip care center, where we can place this child as we look for a more uh, stable foster care for the child. Thank you. Great. Thank you. If Mark. I can also come in on that point, yeah. I think one thing that's really important to remember is that um, interim care or, or other options of care for children should only really be explored if the family is unable to care. So what we're seeing in I'm sitting here in London, for example, is that if a parent tests positive, then it's likely that the parent and the children just isolate together. So we're not necessarily advocating that if you've got a parent who's 
potentially tested positive or who is sick and suspects that they might have COVID to separate from their child. We want to definitely avoid that um, and have them have them stay together because chances are we're not going to see the amount of tests that we need in, in across the globe. And, and we want to ensure that families stay together and only if there's really severe health complications and the caregiver has to go into inpatient treatment would we want to start exploring alternatives. Thanks. Thanks, Lori, for that. Thanks for coming in because, uh, yes, I think that is a very, very key issue, the issue of fam importance of family unity and the fact that because the, the, the risk, the health risk is so relatively small to children um, and all the potential risks of separation potentially can be bigger um, than the small risk of, of infec infection. Plus, by the time you get to that child and want to separate that child, you're likely to have the child already being positive. You may not know it because you don't have access to tests, but because COVID is, uh, is so easy to transmit. Um, so all of these together, I think, just emphasizes on the importance of family unity in this particular case, which wasn't, for example, the case in, during Ebola. Um, and those of you who have worked in uh, during Ebola, you know that it was, it was uh, a given that you would try to separate if you suspected that the child was not um, positive. I want to uh, hand over to Annie because I know Annie has a couple of points that he wants to mention. And then if you have time, we'll go to another question. Annie, over to you. So I need to a minute or so. Uh, I just wanted to, us to all recognize that there is going to be an uh, increased strain on the child protection system in the current few um, uh, in the next few months, and we need to keep in mind that we are all the child protection system as a whole is also going to respond to a number of children who are going to be released from detention because a lot of children and we are advocating very strongly that they need to be released provided it is just we'll also have to work with their families and enable those families to receive those children back and that's where the family strengthening measures come into place. We also need to recognize that children who were initially detained and will be released are equally in need of protection. Um, so the protection system needs to be able to respond to their protection concerns as well. And we'll also need to recognize that some of these children who will be released from detention will not be able to be absorbed back into their own family. So we'll have to make sure that we work together with the alternative care system, especially with foster families who are already enrolled or prospective foster families who may be willing to take on children in foster care uh, to also work with them, not just in terms of providing, so in terms of additional emotional support that these families will also require in terms of helping absorb these children into their families because the children who will be released from detention will already be coming from with their own certain levels of trauma. So I just wanted to flag that issue because that's something that is going to be uh, very important in the next few months. Thanks, Annie. Thank you, Annie, for that. Yeah, it's very important to flag the issue of children deprived of their, li of their liberties and, and what happens to them. Another question uh, that actually has come up several times I, I see in the chat is the issue of children that are being released from residential care centers Mr. Abdinur uh, talked about this, the situation in, uh, in Kenya, um, but the question is about what, what are the follow-up mechanisms for those children, how to make sure that the reintegration happens in a safe way, and how do we track uh, that these children remain safe after, um, after we reintegrate them into their families or other families? Anyone who wants to come in? I'm not sure I have the answer. I think uh, Mr. Abdinur already identified in Kenya how this is happening uh, but it is uh, definitely one of the key concern in a number of countries particularly when there's been quite rapid closing of institutions uh, or, or directive or actually also uh, some of the uh, boarding schools as well in a similar situation. The, the guidance identifies some ways through virtual online uh, monitoring but we know that's actually very limited uh, in terms of what it, what it can actually do in terms of ensuring uh, that there is proper follow-up and support. Um, there, there is uh, uh, some guidance developed by Changing the Way We Care as well around uh, how to do effective virtual um, case management uh, follow-up. And I think that uh, can also provide some really good 
suggestion on practice and what's happening. But it is, it is an area where we are very keen to receive more information, more data about what is being done and what is being learned, including what's not working. So we would definitely encourage all practitioners that are working in countries where this is happening to share that info and also identify um, what kind of response or learning we can consolidate. Thank you. And uh, there's a specific question for uh, Mr. Abdinur and colleagues from Kenya um, on, on how you're adapting the, you mentioned in the, in the presentation, the uh, child protection information management system is being adapted. And uh, one of the uh, participants wants to know how that is being done and what that actually means. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Abdinur. I think, yes, it's uh, quite an interesting question. And one of the things that has been happening in Kenya is that each and every meeting we have been holding, we have been seeing need of a specific set of data. And uh, we had a child protection information management system that has been serving us well in the normal situation and even in some specific emergency situation. But we've just realized that now with the specific scenario that we are for COVID-19, which is affecting the entire country, unlike other emergency situations that were somehow affecting specific countries and specific counties as part of the country. Now we really need a system that can really generate data in a most effective manner. Uh, we are not reinventing the wheel, but what we are trying to see is that if we need a certain information and comparing with what the system is already capturing, how best can we rely on the system? So that is what is happening as of now. And we are confident maybe in the next one week uh, from what we are hearing from the experts in the Department of Children's Services is that the system will be able now to provide information related to COVID without the need for developing any other tool. And uh, there is an app that is being considered to be linked with the system that can be used uh, by um, child protection actors at the lowest level to be able to feed data into the system through the offices of the Department of Children's Services at the local level. We are at time, so I'm going to thank all the panelists, uh, Florence, Brigitte, Frederick, Annie, Lori, uh, Henko, Martin, Catherine, and Mr. Abdinur, and all the, all the participants who joined us uh, at, on a Friday, and uh, hopefully this was uh, a, good experience, a good good kind of uh, time, good use of your time, sorry, it's, it's late on a Friday. Um, and we will be sharing all the information. Um, there's lots of questions about um, tools and technical notes. We will be sharing all of those through uh, Better Care Network website and the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action website. Please go to those websites and, and consult and write to us if, uh, if you have any specific questions. Thanks a lot and have a good weekend and stay negative.